Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of In the Spotlight. I'm Mike Nietzsche. I'm very excited tonight because this guy has done basically everything you could possibly do. He's done work for Tim Allen. He's done work for Everybody Loves Raymond. He's an outstanding cartoonist, a writer, you name it, he's done everything. And it's my privilege to introduce to you the one and only Dave Shelton. And Dave, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor for me, and thank you for taking the time to do this. It, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So, Dave, I think the or first put, thing... Or putting me on, whatever whatever you want to do, <laughs> put me on, have me on, do whatever you want. Yeah. So, Dave, I think the first thing I would ask you is... Uh, did you have like a big love for cartoons as a young kid? I mean, is that what inspired you to get into this? Absolutely. It was um, it, it was kind of a joke when I was little that when I was born, instead of seeing the doctor or my mother or father, I saw the Flintstones. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think that's kind of where the love of that came from. But it wasn't just that. It was pretty much everything in entertainment. Um, I just, I fell in love with it at an early age. You know, it's like everyone always has their horror stories, but for me, it was an escape, but it, it just, I think I was just born to be creative and to, and I knew what I want to do ever since I was little from writing to cartooning, voiceovers, music, anything that was stimulating. I, I believe I was, I wasn't really diagnosed with it, but I know from, seeing other people with it. I have like some ADHD or ADD and a little bit of dyslexia. So it compensated. And I think that's where a lot of creative people uh, come from is I believe there's some sort of that in their background and it makes them want to do stuff. That's why I never get writer's block and I'm always needing stimulus. You know, it's very hard. I mean, I could meditate, but I'm, usually creative and, and my mind just goes at a million miles a minute right so dave let me ask you um it's kind of going a little ahead here but I, I was curious to get your take on it uh obviously when i was a kid watching cartoons especially like in the movie theaters wherever they were you know like i could think of uh who framed roger rabbit stuff like that now the cartoons have kind of changed in a different way they don't to me anyway they don't necessarily look like a cartoon it, it, it kind of more it looks more like you know type like a fraggle rock type setting you know muppets it doesn't look necessarily like a cartoon and i know that's just the you know change of times that you know we have to go with and stuff like that but um do you like the way cartoons are nowadays or do you miss the old way well i miss the old way and you know and i am I'm fine. I'm a techno nerd and I can do the computer stuff and and I could take things apart and put them back together. But for me, it's always been about the story right. and, and the dialogue and the characters. Um, just throwing things in for shock value, which is what a lot of cartoons do now. Um, it, it, does, it doesn't seem to, it's losing its innocence. Um, things have become woke, as you probably know. And it's taking away from the story and, you know, everything's getting vulgar. You know, I don't think the Flintstones, you know, as um, I, I guess out of originality as they were, they, you know, they didn't do anything that was vulgar. It was their family, things like that. But uh, they based it on stories. And, and that's what I like. I mean, there, yeah, there's some that sneak through these days. But a lot of them, you know, and especially the manga and the Dark Horse kind of things and all the anime, which is fine. But I think what it's doing to kids is overstimulating their brains. And right. they're not, they're, it's not about the story anymore. And even people in Hollywood have told me this. It's all about what kind of diversity you can put in, whether it's the characters or the, um, the settings, things like that. But... And, and to me, that's just, it's sort of just like mind candy and it's just, or, or mind crack, basically <laughs> heart crack is what it's becoming. And yeah, I mean, I believe in story. There are some things that, as I said, I still like. Um, for a while, I, I mean, I was a big Simpson file. And when they, <laughs> went, you know, remember a couple of seasons ago, they, they got rid of Apu because Fox yeah. got bought by Disney and then they put the, mandated 
And then they had to make all of the characters that were black with black voices. And I don't care, as long as you're talented, it shouldn't be about the race thing or about the gender thing. It should be who is good for that voice. And, you know, I'm sorry, Dan Castellaneta is, was perfect for those black voices and um, Hank Azari as well. So for them to change, you know, look, they're still having Nancy Cartwright, who I know really well, doing Bart yeah. and, you know, also Millhouse and things. But why aren't they changing them? Why isn't it a kid or a guy? Because, you know, doing voiceovers, a lot of times kid voices are done by women because when guys get older, they lose that innocent voice. It becomes deeper and, and it's hard to reproduce. Um, so, yes, in, in total kind of consolidation of what you asked, um, I really miss the old days. I mean, I still love Scooby-Doo, but even that's become woke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, I, you know, I, I lean back towards the old days of when cartoons and with my stuff, even all the new stuff that I'm creating, it's all based on the 2D style is also based on the story and characters and the fun. Right. And you talk about The Simpsons. One of the things that I didn't like either, I think the first nine seasons, if you remember, the character Homer was hysterical. I mean, he was so funny. Some of the things they'd have him do. And then yeah, it the was like the worst father ever, yeah, but he yeah. was also stupid and innocent about it. Yeah. And listen, what do I know? That show has been on 30 something years, but I've never enjoyed the later seasons that they, they kind of went away from what made it funny and it's never really funny anymore. I mean, Homer's like not when you watch him, like I tried to watch a few over the years and he's not funny anymore. And most of the characters aren't funny anymore. And it's almost like they changed him. Like, if you look at Principal Skinner, it doesn't even sound like him anymore. Like, somewhere along the way, they changed his voice, if you really listen to it. He does not sound the same as he did, like, the first decade that show was on. So I feel like, the you know, if it's not broken, well, don't fix it. But they really changed the dynamic of that show. And not for the better, in my opinion. Well, well Harry Shearer... Sure is a great Principal Skinner. And I think he just tinged it a little, but, or, or maybe as he got, you know, towards senior age that uh, his voice changed a little. But um, for me, as I said, I find that finally, I think when there was a kickback on all of the, the trash of them changing the voices and changing the actors and things like that, I think they started losing an audience. And it's kind of the same with some of the other things, like this Bud Light crap that's going on. And I don't know how explicit our conversations could get here, but, um, or if, you know, your language is filtered, because I tend to kind of get colorful with some of my phrasing. Yeah. But, um, so anyway, how, how much can I say? Can I use like the S word if I need to? Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, well, just with like all, the shit that's going on, I think that they said they finally got it and people were leaving. And so they just, I think that the writers changed back to what the formula was, at least the last couple of seasons. Yeah. And so, I mean, unfortunately, those woke characters are still there. And, and it's fine to add in diversity as far as storylines you know because this the simpsons are great because they make fun of everything when they stopped doing that for a couple of seasons that's what ruined it so yeah. suddenly suddenly the showrunners are starting to kowtow to the studios and to the networks and the networks are a mess anyway so for the fact of them to do that and and same with other some of the other cartoons that's why i love south park they still go after whatever they want, you know, and, and that's yeah. what's great. They're not answering to anybody. So I, I think stay true to your vision. That, that's the problem. People are canceling. This cancel culture is destroying creativity. It's destroying the ability to think. And they're making everybody think their own way. And I've always been outside the studio system. And, you know, I've had successes, but... It's also been very hard when I'm trying to get some of my own projects done. So that's why I've had to do a lot of them myself or with people that I know outside the studio. Um, 
And you know what? Leaving LA was also a big thing for me creatively. And, um, and now I could just do my own thing and not have to worry. And with all the other outlets, you know, like, look, we're doing interviews without being in the studio together. So yeah. the, as I said, I'd love the technology, but I think that um, it just needs to stop being woke and everyone's got to stop being so sen freaking sensitive about everything. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, you brought, you brought up the Flintstones and I loved that show as a kid. Another show I really loved as a kid. And I thought to myself, the Flintstones in this show were a big reason why co cartoons were so popular. But I also look at a show like the Jetsons and I really wish they would bring that back in some way because God, that show was hysterical. I mean, that's the thing too. Sometimes cartoons are put on, I think, but there's really no like um, theme to them or, you know, storyline or anything. And then you always had that with the Jetsons. I mean, the big joke was every episode his boss was going to fire him. He had always did something wrong. And then he'd always want that position as vice president. And if he did something good, hey. He would always say Vice President Jetson, but the show really was a tremendous show. And that's what I mean. Like, uh, right. But Mr. Spacely was always like on him. About, I mean, he was such like a, a typical boss yeah. back then, a corporate boss. Yeah, it really was. But the show was outstanding. And um, that's my only argument. And listen, I'm from a different era. That's just the way things are. A lot of people that watch cartoons say, a lot of kids, they probably love it because that's the era they're used to. But I just, um, I feel like it's lacking something and I could be wrong, but that's just my opinion. Well, it's, it's like an expression that I have. You, um, if you feed someone enough garbage, they're going to like garbage. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like that. And as I said, there's still things that are coming out now that I like, but it's just 90% of it is so throwaway. Uh, no one ever gives anything a chance. You have to copy something else in order for the studio heads um, to actually even consider it. And, and it's sad, I call Netflix crap flicks because there's so much stuff that they put on there that is just so cringe worthy. And I, and I wish they had more people to kind of take chances on things that aren't like that, or they'll do the flavor of the week. And you know, like you were saying with the Flintstone Jets and, Almost everything Hanna Barbera put out was awesome. Yeah. Uh, like I'm friends with some of the guys from the Banana Splits, and that was like their live action. I created a live action show. So, uh, in fact, my children's book, uh, Bag Boy and Sweet Slob, um, one of the original Banana Splits who was in the costume, who also wrote The Howling, and he was one of the producer directors of. Oh, uh, what is it? Um, not Ninja Turtles, but Power Rangers, I believe it was. And Terrence Winkless. So he did a, a dedication in the book. He is from that old school. And some of the stuff, the same with Sid and Marty Croft. I was going to do a show with them. And that's the era that I love. Every, You know, like same with sitcoms. It wasn't all just about like, people sitting around bitching and things like that. You, that's why I loved about like the um, monster is the original monsters. Oh, yeah. I cannot stand Rob Zombie's version of that. And, uh, and I had wanted to like it when I heard it was being made because a friend of mine played grandpa in it. Although we kind of have conflicting views of what he likes about the monsters because he's part of that universe now, but you know, from there and the bewitched and I dream a genie and, oh, yeah. And all of them, everything was different. Mikhail's Navy, The Odd Couple. It, it wasn't just the same things over and over about <coughs> middle class or families just doing things like that. And I like to see things that are fun. And, and no, yeah, Raymond was fine, but even that, and I only worked one season on that one, but even that just sort of got redundant. And I know a lot of people like it. Um, but th things like that King of Queens, yes, there's funny joke lines you could add there, but so when, when I worked at National Lampoon, uh, that was one of, that was like kind of an iconic dream of mine when I was in college at the University of Florida and I pledged a fraternity and I wanted to, and then I saw Animal House and I said, oh my God, 
shit, I want to work for that company someday. Yeah. And sure enough, I got that opportunity. But um, I'm very politically incorrect when it comes to humor. And I have certain characters that are out now that are <coughs> politically incorrect, but I also have ones that are middle of the road and very G-rated, so I run the gamut. And as I said, it all boils down to the story and and what you do with it and make it fun. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny you bring up the monsters. I mean, now, sometimes less is more, and all you need sometimes is just a good, you know, funny story or things like that. Fred Gwynn, I thought was tremendous as Herman Munster because every episode you waited for him to crack up hysterically and oh, know, absolutely. Hit, hit his leg. And to me, that's why my, I was well, my favorite. Oh, really? My, my favorite was when he went on a diet to yeah. go to his reunion, and then he it's like on Thanksgiving, and then he sees his family, and he bursts into the house and eats their yeah. entire dinner. Yeah, and he, but you know, he was always cracking up in that that. You know, he was always happy with himself. If he thought he was being funny, he'd start cracking up. Or if he just, like, was clumsy and he hit something, he'd make those funny gestures with his hands and his face. And that was right. just great writing because that's what people want to see. When they're watching a half-hour show, if it's comedy, they want to be entertained. They want to laugh. And you were guaranteed during that show to laugh the whole half-hour. Oh, absolutely. And the casting is the other thing. Everything in film and TV, cartoons, animation, it has to be collaborative. And and if you're if you're casting wrong, you could have a great script, but if your cast is bad, it's not gonna save it. And it's the same the in uh, the other way. If you have horrible writing, but a great cast, that can't save it either. It's gotta be kind of a combination of both. And there's just very few times where that magic happens together. And uh, and that's why a lot of it is forced. It's not just the monsters, but a lot of the other things that have been coming out with remakes and rehashes and reboots and things like that, um, that are kind of, I think, either dumbing down society, although society is kind of doing that to themselves, but also uh, with the people that are putting it out are just not looking. And that's a sad part. Right. As I said, though, there are a few that do kind of sneak through. So let me ask you this too, uh, Dave, because again, you're, you've done so much work with cartoons. How do you like, and I, I'm not saying I'm against it. Some of them I've really enjoyed, but a lot of times what they do is with TV shows, like I'll, I'll look at Alf and I'll say, I talked about Fraggle Rock before. They tried to make cartoons out of them as well. There was an animated series of Alf and Fraggle Rock and Punky Brewster, right. I believe. Did, did Were you a fan of that? I mean, did you think that was a good idea? How do you feel about that? Uh, well, because I also love puppets, and I create puppets, and I do doll movies. Yeah. Um, I was never the biggest Alf fan, and I think that was just the character. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting. Okay, you have this. And this was the live action one, the sitcom where, you know, Alf is living in the house and he's got the neurotic owner, things yeah. like that. And he, he kind of was like an early preclude to um, that sarcastic dog with the um, cigar. Oh, yeah, yeah. The insult. insult. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but him, but I, I did enjoy Frag Rock because I was also a big Jim Henson fan. And, and he's genius, that guy. Very yeah. Himself. And when he passed, that's the sad thing too. Is so many of these franchises will have once they go, the families will take over, or they'll give it to somebody else, and they don't have the same vision, and they'll ruin it. And yeah. fortunately, uh, some of my work is in the Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, California, and I've always been a big fan of Charlie Brown. They were a huge inspiration on the Charles Schultz's work. Yeah. So. Um, when the Peanuts movie came out a few years back, I was praying they didn't screw up the the feel and dimensions of that franchise because that would have killed it. Yeah. And, and fortunately, they didn't. The movie turned out amazing. Um, but with some of these others, and you know, I know everyone's up on Wednesday, the series, yeah. Yeah. and I wanted I wanted to like it too, but it became a woke CW sitcom. 
or a CW kind of one hour um, 90210 kind of thing, but set in that goth world. And, and that was, that was just bad. And the, some of the casting on that, Louis Guzman as um, Gomez was awful, and the kid that played Pugsley was awful. Yeah, and I like Jen. I thought she did a great Wednesday, and I love Christina Ricci is one of my favorite actresses. I so want to work yeah. with her. I got to meet her once for like two minutes, but um, it's just that they're when they they're forcing it on everything, and it's the same with cartoons. And I've watched SpongeBob since the beginning. And even that's kind of changing a little. Fortunately, some of the newer episodes are still okay. But <coughs> I'm also concerned about what they're feeding the little kids. All yeah. this, you know, and I know some people are going, oh, you're just xenophobic or something. And I said, well, you know what, tough. When you have drag and all these gender hormonal things going after little kids and books, and TV shows and libraries and things like that. Look at the kind of generation you're going to be creating. Um, they're not going to appreciate the other things because they're going to be so stuck on that one thing saying it's okay not to be a girl or not to be a boy. And they're reflecting that in shows. And that like, and I could name like 10 new shows. And I always keep up on the trends of things just so I can be more informative and but but a lot of what I'm seeing is just is so disappointing. Right. And, um, you know, you were talking about you're a big fan of pop hits and stuff like that. And a lot of times people don't realize they play a big part in TV shows. And listen, why did I watch Soap when I was a kid? I didn't watch it because I wanted to see the actors. I saw Bob the dummy and I wanted to see a dummy talk and come to real life. And really, that's what people don't get is just how invaluable puppets are in shows they play a big part in the success of tv oh absolutely like not only for, from them like like i like jeff dunham and i love the fact that he's so politically incorrect too and he's yeah. great because he does it through his puppets and it's really hard to for me for anybody to insult a puppet like they're like the puppet is going to be like racist or something mm -hmm. And and the puppet doesn't care. That's why I yeah. create. And same with clowns. I've been a clown in circuses, carnivals, on um, restaurants, things like that. I've traveled. I was in the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers circus as a, as a clown. And so I created a, a clown character called Bitchy the Clown. And he's gone on to do a lot. He was on this one TV show called Battle Cam and. Um, I have a podcast with them that's doing really well on Spotify called Bitching with Bitchy the Clown. I created a cologne for him that's that's just coming out now called Trash because he lives in a trash can. I mean, uh, but he is the most politically incorrect. He makes Krusty. He, he's actually inspired by Krusty the Clown. Yeah. But he's 10 times worse. And he's from New Jersey. So um, he, he goes after everything. And he doesn't care if someone doesn't like him. But it's hard for people to really say, oh, my God, you're like the worst thing ever because you're a clown. And people get scared of clowns because they don't understand. But for the most part, um, you can insult the clown. And to him, it's a compliment. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm fine with that. Ahead, yeah. So, Dave, um, you've also illustrated a lot of books, um, children's books. I think uh, uh, Bella Boo and uh purple princess and interestingly enough um you collaborated i think with purple princess because i think uh nancy lee gran wrote that book from yeah Jenny i Oscar. did the illustrations for yeah. that and she uh you know an outstanding actress for many years in general hospital but let me ask you this you have to like think how a child thinks when you write this stuff because the children have to be engaged into it, interested into it. So you have to be a heck of a storyteller, but you also have to go back and picture yourself as being a child. So do you kind of look at what you would want if you were still a kid? I mean, how do you go about writing them? I'm still a kid. <laughs> go like, oh my God, you're the most creative adult, but you are like the biggest kid ever. And you know what? I'm fine like that. So many people... You look at the world and you look like how miserable it is and they 
and they're fighting with each other and, and religions are fighting with each other and it's so stupid. So, and then some people go, I wish I was a kid again, or why can't we just retain our childlike qualities? And I, I've always been like that. So for, from my perspective, I've never had a problem writing from a children's point of view and, yeah. or a child's point of view. And, um, and things just pop into my head, like, uh, but I'll look around the world, you know, that's why I love the internet because as, as bad as the stuff that's on there, I could go on there and look up anything I want, either as an inspiration or just something that I want to use maybe an element of. But um, everything comes from me. Like my new children's book that I just finished and it's at my agents right now is called Horace Finds the Meaning. And it's about this little kid who's kind of like me. And he goes around asking different people what they think the meaning of life is so that he could learn. And I right. you know that meaning of life, it means so many different things to so many different people. And, you know, he even goes to a monster. He finds a monster on the street and he asks the monster um, what he thinks the meaning of life is. And he says it's being accepted for looking different. And right. I thought that was so profound because there's so many people that judge people just by the way they look. You know, and I'm not like the best looking guy, but um, I, I would rather base it on who they are and what they do in life and how they treat people as opposed to that just being like, oh, look at me, I'm a Kardashian or anything like that. Um, right. One of the other things that I don't like that I try not to use in my children's stories or anything else I write is just being, you know, and Bitchy will point this out. He's also on Twitter. And he points this out a lot is that when you have shows like Blackish or the other subsequent shows like that, you're, you're creating more racism than there ever was. And you think it's because like white people are racist. You know, what's that? If you had a show called Whitish, you know, how do you think they would react? And you talk about reparations. You look at now, Illinois is going to be paying all these reparations for black people thinking they were all descended from slaves. And I, I'm sorry, I'm half Jewish. And, you know, where's our reparations for the stuff that we went through, like during World War II or in Rome or anything like that? So um, it, it just gets ridiculous when it comes to stuff like that. So I just... Um, I just try in my children's writing to do something maybe to make them think, but I also like to do stuff that is fun. The one that I have out now uh, that's won multiple awards called Bag Boy and Sweet Slob. Yeah. And I, I love that was so me because I'm really into recycling and the helping the world. So it's about this little kid and he, he starts a bag business. So that's why he's called Bag Boy. Right. And, if, if a woman is like walking with groceries and she rips her bag on the way to the car, if he's there, he'll get a bag and he'll replace it. So he meets this girl at school and she's like a total slob. So they work together to clean her room up. And then at the end, they start a business. And uh, we've already got the second book going. Um, and that's called Bag Boy and Sweet Slob, um, The Litter Critter. And right. he, he tries to save the beach from being polluted. So things like that are things that are close to me, but you do it in a fun way. And the, the drawing style was more, I love Tim Burton. He was a big inspiration drawing wise. Him and, and there's other inspirations for my drawings besides Hannah Barbera and Charles Schultz. Um, there is a, there's a few others and a lot of them are in, um, go to cons and things like that by Bob there's a Rago. I'm probably butchering his last name. Um, and then there's one named Terry, who's an amazing artist. He does famous monsters of film land covers. Um, so uh, what is this? I forgot his last name, Terry Wolf something. Right. You could look him up anyway. So uh, these are Wolfinger, I think is his last name. So he's amazing and he's so awesome. But so that's where 
my um, the drawing styles that come from, and I try to relate them to each story that I do. Right. And the thing is about you, uh, Dave, is you you just do a variety of things. I mean, whether it's uh, writing, um, you know, drawing, and then of course music. Um, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you write the theme for the uh, Special Olympics? Weren't you one that wrote? I mean, and that's a great thing you did. And I mean, those Olympics are so awesome to look at. And I mean, they're so those, great. And I mean, you know, those, so fun to watch those. Yeah, those kids are so inspirational. And it's sad that people with Down syndrome are treated like outsiders. And some of the industry is starting to see more of it. Um, there, there's a friend of mine, Caden, uh, and he was, Caden Cox, he was one of the first Down syndrome kids to play college football in yeah. Ohio. Really amazing guy, and he just graduated. Well, the people over at the, college like his coach treated him like shit i found out and he posted it and that's really sad you know saying like you're nothing or you're some sort of reject or a mutant or retard whatever they called him and not just him but other people and it it's sad that that stigma is still there and there's so many people that do that so um, i would volunteer a lot in the olympics back in la and it, it, it just moved me. So one of my writing partners and I, uh, music writing partners, Ben Hammer, we sat down and wrote the song, submitted it, and it got accepted as a theme song. And we premiered it at UCLA. God, this is in the 90s. So it's been a long time. And in front of maybe 10,000 people, it was performed and recorded by a guy from Bold and Beautiful, right. who was one of the actors. He was kind of like one of those Greg Evans kind of guys who can sing, or John Schneider, but yeah. he was in Bold and Beautiful, and he did an amazing job on it. Now, if you ask me his name, I, it's been so long, I forgot. I'd have to look that up. But um, yeah, things like that. And, and I've always loved music. One of my other writing partners was Albert Haig, who wrote How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and he was Professor Shirovsky on Fame, and he was the psychiatrist in the first Space Jam. And I loved him on Fame. Broadway I mean, composer. He, yeah, he was tremendous on Fame, and um, he was always like that teacher that the kids knew they could count on for advice and things like yeah. that. But he was brilliant, too. I mean, he really was. And um, I was just so honored that he asked me to write with him, and we became really close friends right, right up until he passed away. Right. And you were just talking about uh, how people with Down syndrome get treated differently. Um, and it's really unfair that they do. But I also think of a guy like Chris Burke. I mean, look what he did with Life Goes On. I mean, why was that show a success? Because it had a great cast, but he was a tremendous actor. I mean, every episode he did, he shined. And like, it didn't matter like that um, he was dealing with a, you know, a tough thing in his life. He never asked anybody to feel sorry for him and he would go out there and let me ask you i mean do you really think anybody was a better actor than him on that show i don't think so no he he fit that role perfectly uh and it doesn't matter about the disability i look at some of the other actors with disability um look look at the girl with cerebral palsy that was on oh uh, what was that was it not family matters that um well, there was the girl that was on a uh, different stroke. She played different strokes. That's it. Yeah. yeah. She played Kathy on there. I can't remember yeah. her first name, but she was tremendous. I mean, she was funny too on that show. And um, she did a tremendous job and she had a tough uh, disability, but she never, again, she went out there and she didn't ask anyone to feel bad for her. And she she has, she's cerebral palsy and she did an amazing job. Yeah. So, she really oh, and, and same with little people. Like I love working with little people dwarves, midgets, whatever. And I, I have a lot of friends who are little people. And in fact, a couple of the shows that I've done, one was Against Type, which was on Amazon Prime. And then the other show I had, which was actually a kid's show called Professor Creepy Screen Party. And we're working on selling that as a series. Um, I used um, uh, Robert Gildan, uh, no, Michael Gildan, 
who was a little person. His wife was a little person who played William Shatner's girlfriend on Boston Legal. Yeah. And then um, uh, I'm working with Martin Kleba on a couple of projects and things. So I, I just love things that are different because one, in, there's no such thing as normal. When I see religions or I see people labeling people as like, oh, we're normal, we're the, the better people and they should kiss up to us or, or you know, we'll, we'll throw them a crumb or something. I find that so distasteful and insulting. And right. so when I, when I write or create, I like doing things that give them a voice, but also treat them like they're, no, they're normal, like they're the normal ones and the other ones are the freaks. Right. Absolutely. So I'm sure everybody's dream, if you watch, you know, if you watch the Animal House, Blues Brothers, whatever it may have been, is to get that if you're going to be a writer is to work for National Lampoons and you got to be a senior writer. So just talk yeah. about talk about doing that and some of the work that you did that you really enjoyed. At National Lampoon, as I said, it was a dream when I got the opportunity and it transitioned. I, I had was in New York and um, I grew up in Jersey, went to University of Florida, then I went back and I went to the new school to study animation. And while I was there, I got an opportunity um, to work at MTV and Nickelodeon. I worked on Double Dare and oh, then I went to MTV doing artwork for them. And then I was a rock journalist at the same time for Tiger Bee and some rock magazine, 16, things like that. And I was a cartoonist there so as a result, I got asked to work with Tim Allen and Robert Wall and work on artwork for their HBO specials. Right. And that's what brought me to California. I said, you know what, it's time to move west. And I've always wanted to move there. And I got introduced to some people through them who were with National Lampoon. And I went there, showed them my portfolio, the kind of you know humor that I write, things like that. And I got hired. And... <laughs> And that's when I started. And um, I did it. I just did everything. They loved that I was politically incorrect, first of all. So I would do things like um, all the cartoon projects. I created calendars. I wrote ca uh, cartoons for the magazine, for the books. And then I would put sketches together. And ju just about everything that you could think of. And I had a background in branding and merchandising, so they liked that. I did greeting card lines. Um, I wrote pretty much everything. Things got in dispensers and to, to other uh, brick and mortar stores. And we didn't have online back then, so it was all that. And I let anything they threw at me or anything that I came up with was accepted and it was really, really great. Right, and I mean, I was just thinking about what you talked about too, Dave. You uh, had did work with MTV and Nickelodeon. I hate what MTV did, and right when uh, the 21st century began, they just changed everything. They changed music videos were so awesome to watch, and that's all they showed all day. And there was nothing wrong with that. And then they had to go and change everything. They came out with all I, these different shows. But and I think the yeah, yeah I think the real made, world, yeah. I yeah, think, I think world the real world, world it destroyed started. it. Yeah, it really did. But then you think about Nickelodeon. I mean, what a great uh, innovation that was in the 80s, you know, whether it was Nick at night and then Nickelodeon during the day with the game shows. You talked about Double Dare. I think Mark Summers, I think his name was. He was tremendous with that. Nickelodeon, I thought, put on some of the best TV in the world. And maybe it wasn't like ABC, NBC, or CBS, but guess what? That network didn't have to take a backseat to anybody. They put on some great TV. Yes, even through the early 2000s. You know, and I know there's all, I, I, I directed Jeanette McCurdy before she got iCarly. And I knew, I loved her. I knew she yeah. was going to be a star on Nickelodeon or whatever she did. She just had that magic. And she was such a sweet kid. And I knew her family and I knew about her mom's situation and, you know, she was going through not only with the cancer but with the way she treated Jeanette things like that so uh but and I know with Dan Snyder former child actor when he got hooked up with Nickelodeon um 
I, I loved what he did with Nickelodeon with all the shows. He became kind of like the Aaron Spelling of Nickelodeon. Yeah, and yeah. but I mean, of course, you know, later on you find out the behind the scenes things, which you know, I didn't know anything about him doing that. Um, so it's coming out. But what he did in Nickelodeon was great. Now, after that, after the last iCarly like, and the Zoe 101s and things like that, um, I think lately the quality Nick shows have really gone down. Yeah, I do too. And um, I mean, they for a long time, they had it right. I mean, they really did because one of the things. It's a great they, formula. Yeah, one of the things that they were smart about is they knew that when kids got home from school, they wanted something they could watch. And it wasn't necessarily reruns all the time. And they were getting right. these shows at three o'clock in the afternoon, at four o'clock in the afternoon. And then they would lead right up until dinner. So they're getting to watch this TV. So it gives you something to look forward to when you're leaving school. And I always felt like Nickelodeon knew how to cater to the kids. And it's a shame that both them and MTV, as time went on, had to change the, the way they did things. Because like I said, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And I, I right. think it was a bad moved by both of them and i think yeah and again it's with the writing like shows like the fabulous thundermans and things like that so it's the writing is so cringe on these shows now you know yeah. it's not the same as a good writer being on the show to save it you have you have now it has to be woke like i tried watching the new iCarly on paramount plus and it's awful With, without yeah, Jeanette, yeah. you know they tried to get this black girl in there who was supposed to be the smarmy replacement for her. it doesn't work um the characters are, are it's kind of the same as when roseanne was kicked out of her show yeah it, for her mouth but you know they and and the hypocrisy of it you know how John Goodman came to her defense. He didn't. If he was going to defend her, he wouldn't have renewed the show unless she was included. But right. now the, mo the money was there, and and I stopped watching it after that. And and it's not the same without her. It's well, like a I half mean, it show. Was, the show was about her. When you think yes, about it. it's mean, called Roseanne for a reason. It wasn't yeah. called the Connors before I mean, that. I'll give, the, I'll give them credit for this. They've been able to keep that series on the air and I thought it wasn't going to work. And I think it's been on five years since, you know, she was fired. But at the same time, like when you're having a reboot of a series, you, you want to watch the main characters that you're used to seeing. And then when one is gone, that's, that's the end of it. I mean, it, it's hard to like get into it when the it's like you know when dallas a few years back tried to do a reboot and then larry hackman passed away you knew that show wasn't going to last because if right no it, was, it was doomed from the beginning yeah well it's, no, a, it's the same with the brady bunch when they brought oliver and that was like yeah, because that was terrible them. and you know the the thing is too is like um sometimes shows do that and they don't realize that they are ruining everything that they believed in with the show and what they wanted what they were looking for the mission statement and stuff like that and i mean i i don't know why they decided to bring it you know that's for another day we could talk about but when they did bring a cousin oliver in i mean nobody could buy it, yeah, it was, a, it was supposed to be a show three boys three girls and now you got this other boy in here it made no sense well that that's part of it, it was sort of a desperation thing because they felt the ratings were slipping and they had to put it in. Uh, it's the kind of same when bringing Ricky Siegel into the Partridge family. Yeah, and yeah. I, I love, I created a show for Danny Bonaducci and hopefully he's, he's kind of been sick and, but he's recovering thankfully. So we're sending good prayers for Danny, but I created a game show for him, which of course was stolen and by Byron Allen, um, right. but still working on it. And uh, and it's it's things like that that could kill any project or any series, um, you know. And I think with the ones like I mentioned, like our Carly and the Connors and things like that, without the original, it's like a band, you know, being in music. If there's a band, I'm a purist when it comes to entertainment or originalities. Like every Munsters reboot to me, without Fred Gwynn in it. 
was not a monster. No, but it's and and that's the same as I say with the new monsters movie. I'd love Rob Zombie, but he did not. And you know, it was scared. But the thing is, it's like with the audiences now, they're, they're trying to dumb down, and it's. And it's sad because Hollywood thinks they are the epicenter of humanity. Like, yeah. oh, the, all of America now is liking this. And they don't real. they think that America is transmogrified into some sort of drony little country where everything is about black or Latino and then and Democrats and things like that. So I think that's, destroying it and then they don't realize that a lot of America isn't like that you know they're try I think they're trying I think Hollywood and them are trying so hard to change people to their views without respecting the audience that that it's it's turning everything off and people are getting kind of pissed I'm sorry but there's still 300 million Americans that are in this country that hold to the traditional values family things like that. And the fact that the media and all of them are not caring and just inserting all this stuff in there, thinking that, oh, we're going to make you like this. I think it's just, it's going to not only destroy Hollywood, but it's going to destroy the country. And we got to be really careful about that. Yeah, definitely. So let me ask you this, Dave. Um, what, what, like, um, Obviously, there's a writer's strike which is going on, and now there's who knows when new shows are going to be made because they got to settle this strike. But uh, what are you, what are you looking to do in 2023? To I mean, it, the year's you know only about four months left, five months left. But uh, w what can we look forward to for Dave Shelton? Well, it's funny you mentioned about the strikes. It's now SAGs on strike and they're kind of supporting each other. Uh, one, you know, I'm fine with the Writers Guild and things like that and them asking for things, but, uh, and, you know, definitely the studios and the producers and the executives are all gouging profits and yes, writers should be getting more. I, you know, I'm lucky. I feel lucky to just be able to write and do it myself. I'm not in the union, so. Right. I'm fine writing. If it, if a studio wants to hire me to write, I'll write for whatever. I think some people just get a little greedy. And, you know, like, remember there was a strike a bunch of years back when they were fighting over streaming rights? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and they got a little bit of concessions there. But I think... Um, I think Hollywood is just so greedy on all levels and, right. and it, it kind of turns me off to that. And, you know, I've been rejected by a ton of studio people because they say your stuff is too out there or it's not exactly like everybody else's, even though they'll say it's brilliantly written or it's so conceptual or it's so original. And, um, and you know, so as far as the strike goes, I wish them well. But I, I would be fine writing for something for somebody else. But in fact, I have gotten hired to write for other people recently. But I just spend most of the stuff writing for my own. So with that, for this year, um, I've got the new children's book. I'm, um, I've got a couple of film projects. I just did a short film called Dolls in Conversation. Right. And, uh, and that's a short film about dolls who... In, <laughs> This is how my mind works. And uh, there's a doll club, kind of like a like a cafe for dolls. And they go there, they drink, they eat, they have conversations about humans. So I said, what would it be cool to put hidden cameras in this doll club and just videotape them talking to each other and see yeah. what they say? And so I created a short film. It's on YouTube right now. And then um, I'm also working on a TV show version of Bitchy the Clown, and I'll be doing more podcasts for him. I have a syndicated radio show that's been on a few years now called Cemetery Go-Go, and it's kind of inspired by Dr. Demento, who was one of my favorite radio DJs between him and Wolfman Jack and Harry Harrison from New York. And right. cousin 
See, of course. So that's been on stations around the country. And I just got picked up by Bowling Green's station. Oh, nice. So I'm going to be sending them the shows. And so I'm working on that. I'm doing a new horror film. I wrote a film for Sean Young. And she signed on to it. Uh, Music-wise, I've been doing a lot of writing. I'm going to be performing. I have two songs actually from Bitchy on the soundtrack for a really horrible movie uh, called Slice. It's, it's like a really bad $2 version of Caddyshack, like a horror version. Right. It's awful. But Bitchy's songs are on there. And he liked it because he got them on IMDb now. Right. So he, he's up in arms about that. And then the cologne, which is called Trash, and that'll be coming out. And I've already been selling bottles. I'm going to be doing book tours. I've got the new books coming out. I wrote a, a song called Black Creek for a friend of mine, Cynthia Rothrock, who's oh. an international martial arts star actress. Yeah. So she decided to write and produce her own movie, and she got all this money from crowdfunding. And they're gonna be, and she got all her martial arts friends, even like the guy who did Taibo, Billy Banks, oh, or okay. whatever you call him. He's in it, and Don the Dragon Wilson, and um, he has so, the guests I've tried to get for like five years. I mean, it's been who so has hard. Is? I've been trying to get Cynthia forever and never could really, get her. yeah. Oh, she's one of my best friends, I could refer her to you easily. That would be great. She'll, I mean, she'll probably trying... want to promote the movie on the on there. Yeah, I mean, I would love to. I mean, to me, like I, I've said this all along. I know we're getting a little off topic, but I mean, um, she. I, I've always thought that she was number one when it, and I'm no expert in it. I just watched her films, but she was so flawless in everything she did. I always thought, to me, she is the number one martial artist. That's just my opinion. Oh, female? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. you know, some people will sort of switch to, you know, some of the other, like the Asian actresses, um, like, uh, oh, what's her name? Michelle. Michelle, you, yeah, I can't say her last yeah. name, but uh, she's talented as well, yeah. But, but Cynthia is kind of like the all-around hot, you know, really talented, can do a lot of different things kind of actress. Yeah. So, um, and she did it at like, a time when there were really no women doing it in movies. no. Yeah, and it's, and it's so funny because she loved doing all the love scenes in the movie too. Yeah, which yeah. I thought was so funny. If you remember too, she was in the Dukes of Hazard reunion. They brought her in, and she played a nice part in there. So I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, she's, yeah, she's, credit. Been, she's been able to do a lot. And so yeah. I wrote this song. It's called Black Creek. It's a western, and um, so I wrote this song called Black Creek for possibly being the theme song. And I'm hoping, you know, they're not going to get to the music until that. They're shooting, I believe, in New Mexico starting September, October. So once that's completed, then we can figure out. And I've already got two singers in mind for the song. And I, I think the song could be, especially if it's part of a film, an Academy-nominated song or so Grammy. I don't know. Because it has that feel, kind of like the one where... The uh, Jeff Bridges movie a few years back where Ryan Bingham sang the song and then it won the... Oh, yeah. What uh, was that? That was a good movie, too. Heart, that, um, something Hearts. Crazy yeah, Heart. That's crazy it. Heart. Yeah. Um, this song kind of has that feel to it, but it I think it's more upbeat, and especially in the melody. So hopefully that'll you know be used in the film. And Cynthia said she liked it. So we'll, we'll see. So there's that. And, uh, you know, there's there's other things that are in the works as well. Well, you know, Dave, I mean, this the list of things you do and what uh, people probably don't realize either, too, is you coach basketball for a little bit as well. I mean, you coached with Mike Dunleavy, who, you know, I can remember when he coached the Lakers in the early 90s, you know. That's, did a tremendous well, actually, it was the mid-90s, and that was when yeah. I – that's when I coach with him. Yeah. Cause I've and always I, loved sports. And even though I'm a kind of a creative person, I'm very athletic or at least until my knees went out. But yeah. well, that was so funny in school, kids didn't know whether to beat me up or to make me one of their own because I was a nerd. I was with the AV club. I was with the newspaper 
and yet I also played sports and I was the announcer for some. So right. it was like beating up one of their own if they beat me up. <laughs> but I mean, it really is impressive, the stuff you do. And I mean, it just sounds like to me that every day that you wake up, you're motivated to do something. And I mean, this list of uh, accomplishments that you have to your resume is really impressive. And uh, it was an honor for me. And I really do thank you for giving me a few minutes today. Oh, my pleasure. And it's just everyone always says you have to do what you love or you're not going to be happy, even if you don't make money at it. And as I said, I've had years of struggle and rejection and people saying, oh, my gosh, you know, you have to change this out or either. But I, you keep true to yourself and you'll be fine. Just, uh, just never give up what you love to do. And I love to do it. And if other people are happy with it, great. That, that's all the better. If I'm making a difference in the world, that's what matters to me. Right. And you definitely are. And, you know, folks, um, you really get to see somebody behind the scenes who makes the magic work, who makes the music work. And we always watch cartoons as kids and we wonder how these uh, talented people make it happen. Well, Dave Shelton just kind of gave you a little idea of how it's done, but it's really a credit to him and everyone else who makes that stuff work behind the scenes, because without it, it doesn't happen. And Dave Shelton, like I said, is a credit to the industry and he's really somebody that's very invaluable. So Dave, thank you again. For I appreciate it. Just don't, just don't ask me to do any plumbing or construction <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah, will do. But Dave, thank you again. And uh, folks, thank this you. was of course the one and only Dave Shelton. I'm Mike Kenichi. This is in the spotlight saying good night, everyone. All right. Perfect.